today on K News, Ariane 5 and Atlas 5 launch. Hey guys, I'm Lucas and welcome to K News for week 12, 2017. Europe's Ariane 5 is first and its takeoff is scheduled for March 21st at 20.31 UTC from Kourou in French Guiana. The rocket will as usual feature its two giant strap-on boosters, which burn solid fuel. These complement the core stage, which reacts hydrogen and oxygen to water inside its combustion chamber. The lighter and hotter the exhaust gas is, the faster it shoots out of the nozzle, which makes it more efficient. More speed to the back basically means more speed to the front for the same amount of fuel. On top of that is the upper stage, which burns the same fuel and carries two satellites, KoreaSat 7 and SGDC. Both satellites are separated by SILDA, which is a neat system to avoid stacking these satellites directly onto each other. Igniting and checking its Vulcan 2 core stage will take 7 seconds, after which it also ignites its boosters. From here on out, there is no going back and the rocket will shoot to the sky. At 13 seconds into the flight, Ariane 5 will begin its pitch maneuver, leaning itself towards east and it will from there on follow a ballistic trajectory. Such a trajectory is key to minimize the forces on the payload. Flying a ballistic curve like this, without propulsion the payload would feel weightless, so although it is tipping to the side, there is no force pulling down and shearing the payload to the ground, as long as the rocket follows this natural track. But of course, the engines are firing, so the main force pushes the satellites into their mounts. A little over 2 minutes into the flight, the boosters will separate, because they are empty and have bought the core stage enough time and space to burn for 6 more minutes, without dropping back to ground. Within these 6 minutes, the core will boost this trajectory even further and the upper stage up to speed so it can perform its 15 minute long burn, which will inject its payload into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. As mentioned, on board are two communication satellites. The smaller one is KoreaSat 7, which will be placed at an orbital position above Southeast Asia at 116 degrees east. Its mirrors will distribute direct to home services to India, Korea, Indochina, Indonesia, and the Philippines. The second bigger satellite is SGDC or Geostationary Satellite for Communication and Defense for Brazil. It will be placed in a geostationary slot at 75 degrees west and cover Brazil with satellite internet. The total data rate is 57 gigabit per second, which is a lot but of course shared by all its recipients on ground. Once released, both satellites will circleize and find their correct spots on their own. Since the initial elliptic orbit has a different orbital period than the geosynchronous 24-hour orbit, the satellites can time their circularization such that it will be completed at the right time. Next up to launch is ULA's Atlas V on March 25th at 1 UTC from Cape Canaveral. Atlas will fly in its 401 configuration, meaning it will have no strap-on boosters on its core stage, which is driven by a Russian RD-180, burning kerosene and oxygen. On top is the much more efficient center rubber stage using the US RL10 engine and hydrogen and oxygen as a propellant. Behind the 4 meter wide fairing is the Cygnus spacecraft built by Orbital ATK and packed with cargo for the International Space Station. This one is named SS John Glenn after the first US astronaut in orbit, who circled the Earth three times in 1962. Atlas V takes just 4 seconds from ignition to liftoff, but begins its pitch program at T-18 seconds. This means it takes around about 17 seconds for it to pick up enough speed so it can start to follow a steadily increasing ballistic curve for a little more than 4 minutes. After engine cutoff, it will take 6 seconds until the upper stage gets separated and 10 more seconds until the RL10 engine gets started. That's roughly 16 seconds of freefall, which is quite a lot in my opinion and worth mentioning. As mentioned, Cygnus will head to the ISS, so the rocket will follow the station as it flies by the launch site at 51.6 degrees against the equator. On board are a lot of CubeSats, which will be deployed from the ISS, but also regular cargo like food and other supplies. As an example, there will be a constellation of 30-ish satellites, which will study the Earth's thermosphere between 90 and 350 kilometers. The thermosphere is, as the name suggests, a very hot region of our atmosphere with temperatures above 1000 degrees Celsius. This sounds like a lot, but the temperature of a gas is measured by the speeds of the particle it's made of, and while they are very fast up there, the gas itself is very very thin at the same time. This means while hot, the gas is still no harm for rockets, for example, because there are just not enough particles to transfer noticeable amounts of heat. Speaking of heat, Cygnus will again carry a spacecraft fire experiment, this time Sapphire 3 to orbit. 
the experiment will stay on the ship and be executed once the upper stage leaves the station again. While on a re-entry trajectory, where the spacecraft can do no more harm to anyone, Sapphire 3 will produce and study a fire in space. From this scientists can learn more about how flames behave in microgravity, but also how fires spread in closed environments like submarines and mines deep underground where the oxygen supply is limited. Once Centaur releases Cygnus, it will orbit the Earth on a lower altitude to catch up with the station. Centaur itself will meanwhile perform a re-entry burn and not even complete a single orbit before it will re-enter the atmosphere a little south of Australia. That shall conclude K-News for this week and I hope to see you next one if you like. Auf Wiedersehen and thank you for watching. <laughs>